Hi, I'm Richard Weiss, former president of the Explorers Club, and I'd like to welcome you to the Explorers Club 50 lecture series. If you're new to the club and to the lecture series, I'd like to welcome you and tell you a little about ourselves and also about the Explorers Club 50. First of all, the Explorers Club was established in 1904. At that time, by a bunch of guys trying to get to the North and South Pole. And since that time, our members have covered just about every corner of the earth. In fact, when you walk into the lobby of our historic headquarters on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, there is a plaque on the wall that perhaps summarizes it best. Our members have been the first to step foot on the North Pole, first on the South Pole, first to stand upon Mount Everest, the highest point, the first to go to the lowest point in the ocean, and also our members were the first to go to the moon. Other notable explorers have been Theodore Roosevelt and Jane Goodall, and just about every notable explorer of the 21st century. Now about the Explorers Club 50. The slogan is 50 people who are changing the world that the world needs to know about. And I'll give you a little genesis of how that started. Uh, last uh, spring, during the beginning of the pandemic, one of our members said to me, you've got to check out this performance or this video called Earthrise by a young poet named Amanda Gorman. I watched it and it was about the Apollo 8 mission, which were our members. And I was blown away by how she described Earth, the environment and the fragility of our planet. We, we started a, a, sh a short correspondence and became pen pals. She became a member. But I also thought, how many other Amanda Gormans are out there in the world? In fact, when I got together with the chair of this program, Joe Rohde, who you'll be meeting in just a few minutes, you know, we got together and we said, how do we want to describe exploration in the future? And if we're truly a global exploration society, then our club has to represent the world as we see it. And not just in terms of how people look, but also how people describe the earth and the sky and just about everything in science. So how did we choose the EC50 honorees? 50 people who are changing the world that the world needs to know about. The first thing Joe Rohde said to me was that if you take a problem and you approach it with the same people you are always going to get the same type of result. So I, he immediately said, we wanted as diverse a judging panel, people who could look at the world through a different narrative and lens and be able to come together with some sort of conclusion. So he put together a group that was from all over the world. The next thing we had to do is have our membership give us people that they have met along the way that were doing incredible things that maybe weren't recognized for their work. We got about 450 nominations. And I have to tell you, they were pretty amazing. We could have gotten an EC 200 out of it. We came out with our top 50 uh, honorees and the result was nothing less than spectacular. We have people covering all sectors of disciplines from space to paleontology, oceanography, we have Inuit, Native Americans, Americans, Sri Lankans, Indians, Africans, and just across the border. So this is the inaugural lecture series, and we'll have a few more that'll be rolling out over the week. But in the meantime, I want you to sit back and enjoy some good old fashioned storytelling. Hi, I'm Joe Rohde. I've been a member of the Explorers Club since 2010, and I chaired the Explorers Club 50 committee, and so I've had an opportunity uh, to learn about all of these great individuals. I'm excited now to kick off a series of conversations with them, uh, and in a few moments we'll get into that, uh, but first let's enjoy what they have to say about themselves. Well, hi, my name is Callie Broadus, and I'm a wildlife photographer and conservationist, and most recently the founder of Reserva the Youth Land Trust. It's an organization I started in 2019 to bridge the gap between youth activism for the environment and tried and true methods of biodiversity conservation. And it started as just the nugget of an idea for a single project to create the world's first entirely youth-led, youth-funded 
nature reserve. And it quickly developed into a lot more than that and into a, a fully formed now nonprofit organization. So prior to launching Reserva, I spent about seven years designing books often about wildlife at National Geographic Kids. It was a job that I absolutely loved and it taught me so much about the importance of engaging young people uh, with the natural world early on. And leaving what was objectively a dream job for something that I knew would take a year or two to get off the ground was a little scary, but I've never looked back. So I'm going to share a few sort of speed dating slides about Reserva. And then because this is the Explorers Club, I'll take us into the Ecuadorian Chaco cloud forest with some new footage from our 2020 expedition. Our mission is to empower young people to make a measurable difference for threatened species and habitats through conservation, education, and storytelling. From a conservation perspective, we launched around this first project to create an entirely youth funded reserve. And we immediately teamed up with Rainforest Trust who have funded the protection of over 30 million acres of forest around the world and their Ecuadorian partner, Fundacion Ecominga. The site is about 244 acres in the Northwest of Ecuador. And it ranges from 900 meters at the Pylon River, which you see in the top photo, to 1700 meters at the top of Peñas Blancas, which means white rocks. And that's in that bottom photo, that's our site edge. But we're not going to stop with this project, which is already about two thirds funded. In the future, we intend to create a network of youth funded reserves around the world. Our focus is on conserving biodiversity hotspots. So our current site is not only one of the most threatened places in the world, but it's also a key biodiversity area, home to iconic species like the ocelot, the critically endangered brown-headed spider monkey, and many important and lesser known species like these toads, the critically endangered Adelopus koine and the endangered Rabo colomai, as well as countless species of new to science orchids like this Dracula species and so much more. And perhaps the most important part of all of this is the team of Ecominga Park guards on the ground who work tirelessly to ensure the protection of this landscape. Hector, Nilo, Milton, Giovanni, David, and Rolando. As we raise funds for the conservation of this landscape, some of that money is included to support these critical salaries. They are our protectors on the ground, but they're supported by a community of protectors of a different sort from all around the world. This is the Reserva Youth Council. One of the few times we've attempted to take a group photo, sorry about that. It's the body that leads this organization and comprises about 60 people from 16 countries. They lead and implement everything we do, including most of the fundraising efforts for this reserve. This has come together through dozens of individual fundraisers, hundreds of youth donations, uh, like Justin Sather on the left campaigning to save frogs, Junya and Keanu from Chennai, India donating their savings, and Joe Wilkins who ran 45 miles this fall along the coast of Wales just to raise money. But for those who can't donate or fundraise or who already have and want to do more, we have our One Million Letters for Nature campaign. It asks young people to write a letter saying what they love about nature and asking world governments to commit to protecting at least 30% of our planet by 2030. It's supported by National Geographic Campaign for Nature. And we promise to uh, match every single letter we, we collect with $3 toward this youth funded reserve, kind of like a global lemonade stand. But for me, the best part is always getting into the field where my role is to lead reservist participation on expeditions. This is the site. We hike up the left side of this ridge and down the valley at about a four hour per mile pace. The terrain is incredibly steep, it's super difficult, but what lies inside of this pristine forest is well worth the hike. Our main role is to be the storytelling team. If we're gonna convince young people to support this reserve, they need to see what lives inside it. We film, photograph, and write about the work that Ecuadorian scientists and rangers are doing to study and conserve this site. For example, in November, they launched their very first bird monitoring program at the site using mist nets to capture birds and record data, both expanding their list of the known species at the reserve and training the park guards with this important skill set in the process. 
The majority of my time on expedition is spent documenting specimens for the herpetology team, which is led by Inavio scientist Mario Yanez. This is one of the stars of our reserve, a critically endangered toad called Adelopis koine. Every single individual we find is photographed for identifying markings, and the team returns periodically to track the health of the population over time. And again, the park rangers are trained on how to find and identify these creatures, which are so tiny, so they can monitor the site year round. Another species included in the monitoring program is Rabo colomai. It's an endangered toad, once thought extinct, and this is one of my favorite species because it always looks like it could just mess you up. Even as a juvenile, I find their blood red eyes just hilariously ferocious. For every specimen collected, whether it's a frog and a knoll or a snake, my job is to get high resolution photographs from every angle, dorsal, ventral, front, back, and each side. Once preserved, they'll lose their color, so getting high resolution imagery is essential. But what really makes these expeditions special is that our team always includes young conservationists from the Reserva Youth Council. On my last expedition, that included Polish-American herpetologist Pearson McGovern, who supported the HERP team, and Natalia Espinosa from Ecuador, who was kind of my right-hand film and photo assistant. It's really special to see these young people who have given countless hours to protecting this place from afar, exploring this reserve from within. I'm out of time, but please do go check out their field notes on our website, as well as the others written by Reserva Youth who have been on expedition before and since then. So that's us in a nutshell. I'm really honored to be part of this group. So thank you so much to the Explorers Club for the opportunity to share. Namaskar, I am Supraja Darini, born and raised in Chennai, the rapidly growing city in South India. The city with its corporate parks and large shopping malls in stark contrast to the fishing villages that we work in. Hand pumping their drinking water and sometimes having 10 hours of power cut, but yet living in harmony with nature and understanding that their livelihoods depend on the ocean. My childhood quest to know the purpose of my life led me to study Indian philosophy, which explained how I should see myself in all beings. I've always been drawn to the ocean. One morning in December 2001, as I was walking along the beach near my home, I happened to see a turtle on the shore. Sadly, the turtle had a number of injuries and had passed away. A local fisherman casually told me that turtles get entangled in the trawl nets of mechanized boats, suffocate and die. This is a common sight during the breeding season between December and March each year, he said. Then I remembered Dr. Jane Goodall's words that each and every individual can make a difference. And on that beach, there and then, I decided to do what I could to prevent the deaths of more sea turtles. I'm an artist by profession with a doctorate in philosophy and no real knowledge of sea turtles. I knew I had a lot to learn. The first conservation efforts on the Southeast Indian coast were started in 1972 by noted herpetologist and good friend, Romulus Viteko, who at that time recorded 100 nests per kilometer along the Chennai coast. In 2002, I learned that we had already lost an astonishing 90% of the sea turtle population. It became imperative that we should conserve the few remaining turtles and their habitats. Here I had an insight. If we reached out to the community, they too would reach out and assist us. My mission had begun, so I convinced five young fishermen to come with me for an environmental education workshop to the Madras Crocodile Bank Trust. The five fishermen then convinced a dozen others to join in. 
Towards the end of the workshop, as I hoped, they volunteered to protect the sea turtles if I would train them in conservation methods. Thus was born our first Sea Turtle Protection Force members. The following nesting season, I involved myself in late night and early morning turtle patrols with the help of the fishermen. As I walked my way back each morning through the fishing villages and by their homes, I became more involved with the community. I realized that conservation and community development go hand in hand. Only when we cared for their well-being would they become involved in conservation. It had to be an integrated community-based conservation program involving the children, the women, the youth and the fishermen. As the olive ridley is a flagship species, our conservation efforts, we believe, also benefit other sea turtle species and their habitats. As with any conservation program here at Tree Foundation, we often face challenges. Getting the communities and the various government departments to work together has been and still can be a challenging task. It is during the more difficult times that I remember when I first saw a baby turtle emerge from the sand and go to the sea. It crawled across the beach, fell into a footprint, tried to crawl out, but got caught in an old slipper washed ashore. It crawled back out again and finally reached the water. That's when the first wave hit it hard and it turned upside down. I ran to help the hatchling, but before I could reach it, it turned and oriented itself towards the sea and headed straight in. It was determined to succeed. People are not uncaring. They are just unaware. Reaching out to as many people as possible to teach the interconnectedness of our lives with that of the ocean. The land-ocean connection is the cornerstone of many of our conservation programs. We also involve the media at every opportunity to help spread the conservation message and simply make people more aware that their actions can have either a negative or a positive impact on both land and sea. To help spread the conservation message, we work jointly with the forest departments of Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh and Odisha, the Marine Police and the Indian Coast Guard. Since the early days of 12 volunteers, Tree Foundation now has 363 Sea Turtle Protection Force members who form the backbone of our conservation efforts and also encourage participation from the communities of the 222 fishing villages along the east coast of India where we work. Protecting just the nesting turtles is not enough. Protecting the turtles at sea is also crucial. We are working closely with the commercial trawl fishers towards the implementation of turtle excluder devices in their trawl nets. Tree Foundation is the first NGO in India to conduct turtle excluder device sea trials with the commercial trawl fishing fleet of Kasimedu Fishing Harbour in Tamil Nadu. There is still much to be done. As Dr. Jane Goodall's Roots and Shoots volunteer coordinators in India, we are networking with more than 100,000 students who are involved in many different eco-programs. Programs such as water body restoration, biodiversity education, and marine mammal conservation. We recognize that all stakeholders have a part to play in the conservation work, whether it's a powerful state department or a simple mother in a fishing village. There was a time when village children would dig up eggs and play cricket with them. Through education and involving the community, such sites are thankfully a thing of the past. The STPF members have, through their conservation program, released over two and a half million sea turtle hatchlings safely into the sea. Through establishing the STPF program, Tree Foundation has given artisanal fishers a secure long-term alternative income to fishing. 
that allows them to plan a future for their families. He can now send his children to school for longer and can also afford proper health care for his family. Knowing that people who may have once intentionally have hunted and killed turtles or poached eggs are now working to protect the very species they once harmed shows that with the right attitude and hard work, the seeming impossible can be made possible. I believe a lasting legacy of Tree Foundation will be one of hope and a renewed compassion for nature. For all of those who have come to be part of Tree over the years, We are the guardians of this precious and fragile blue planet for future generations of all life forms. Of course, and being selected to be among this prestigious group is a great honor, is truly something that I will cherish. Together, we can make a difference. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Inria Liklele from Iwaso Lions. I'm a Samburu elder living in Sasab village and my community are pastoralist communities who have been a conservationist from years and years and we have been living with wildlife for all those years. So conservation is not very new to us. And I joined Iwaso Lions when I was a warrior. And when I first joined, I don't know about lions conservation. And now a West Lions have taught us a lot about lion conservation and how we can live alongside lions in our region and protecting from our livestock. Our mission is to promote coexistence between lions and people. The lion situation in the whole continent is very threatened. Lions are declining in number rapidly. Um, in the whole continent, there are about 20,000 lions are left in the wild. And in my country, Kenya, we have 2,000 lions in the whole country. And in my own homeland, we started with very few lions, about 11 lions. And now I'm very happy that we are living and we are monitoring 50 lions in the whole ecosystem. The main threat facing lions in my country is loss of habitat. Lions are running out of space. Yes, you'll see a lot of grass here. I don't mean that lions eat grass, but there's no happy force for the lions to eat. And while that is very short and they don't find anything else like wild prey, then they tend to go after the livestock, my community livestock, even mine. And therefore that is when the lions are being killed, shot, and also poisoning. And that is the big threat that we're facing in this in this area. And therefore, that's why West Lions is very dedicated, focusing on community. We, we really believe that working with the local community who live alongside lions conservation, is then lions are safe. And that is why we have the Warrior Watch program, the Mama Simba program, and that is why we are working with the kids as well, really to dedicate ourselves and really invest in our community how to live alongside our lions. The Warrior Watch program is something that I started. Looking at how lions are going after the, the community livestock, I said the best way to protect both livestock and lions is to bring the Warrior Democratic Group, which are more neglected within the conservation decision making, to become the wildlife ambassadors. And when we started, we started with five. 
and we did an evaluation and see how much they, that can change and that is why we have all those lions within our homeland so they go out before the community release their livestock for grazing and once they see the lions where they're hiding then they communicate that message back to the community to avoid that area and by doing that the lions are safe and also their lives are safe so they alert the community telling them to be very vigilant we hold the, the community meetings with them we talk with other warriors and now because those warriors have moved from the warrior watch program to become the junior elders like myself now we are starting again the new generation of new warriors into land conservation and i'm very very happy to say that lions have felt very safe and now we have lions living with the community outside the protected areas in a community land like here where we are now now we can hear lions at night well before you'll never hear because they don't feel safe but now they feel safe and they roar uh, at night we have a female called nana matia become so famous within my society every track here around is all about nana matia and that shows how successful our programs are and when I began working with lions, I, I didn't like lions before I joined the lions. Surely I hated lions, same as other community members. And when I realized that lions are going are facing huge threat, this is how the lions are surviving in my own homeland. I began loving lions so much. So I count them just like my, my cows. I know every individual lion. And I got my favorite, favorite lion called Nanai. And Nana mean mine. So when she was so young, she's always the last to nurse. She's always the last to walk with her mother. And I become, I became so much loving her. And anytime I feel like oh, lions are going in a northern safe area, I always think about this female. And she is my favorite, favorite lion that I can't stay without seeing her. And becoming loving lions. I became the busiest man ever in this region. My phone doesn't stop ringing. And I got all the calls of all the lions. And day to day of mine, the day that I go to community to hold a meeting, so rushing to solve, solve conflict when the lions cause problem and kill people livestock. And I coordinate the Warrior Watch program. So I'm always on run. And I drive so crazy my car and every year, my tires are turned on because of how much I drive around making sure that lions are safe. So many times people ask us, what, do you have a fish of lion conservation in Northern Kenya? And I believe and saying strongly, yes. The, my community, we have been always conservationists from the beginning. Yes, things are getting harder. The cultures are changing. The, the landscape is changing the population of people, the development. But I still have a very strong hope. We are on top of those things to control it before it goes out of hands. And I really believe with my community, with my team, we have a very strong hope of lion conservation in Northern Kenya. And we are not going to let lions disappear in my homeland. Hello, my name is Onkuri Majumdar and I am so honored to be selected as an Explorer 50. Thank you so much. I'm from India and I have spent nearly 20 years now working on wildlife trafficking issues. And you could say most of my work has been involved in training and supporting government as well as private sector entities and agencies on stopping wildlife trafficking. So my team and I, we've been out in the forest training frontline rangers on how to safely and effectively patrol their areas, how to recognize signs of poaching, how to deal with violators safely, how to even protect themselves from wild animals. And once a crime has been committed, the case is usually transferred to the police or customs agencies. So we've done a lot of trainings for them as well. And this includes teaching them again on how to recognize wildlife crime, how to gather intelligence, how to process that intelligence, how to gather evidence in such a way that it leads to an arrest 
and or a seizure of assets during the conviction. Because when you look at these syndicates, people are usually replaceable, especially if they're low down in the syndicate. But even the higher level or middle level people are eventually replaceable. However, seizing the assets of a syndicate, which could be the jewelry, the land, the properties, the vehicles, and so on that they've bought with the profits of their wildlife trafficking activities. Once you seize those, once you seize that financial backing of the syndicate, that's a crippling blow for the syndicate. It's quite difficult for them to recover from that. So we focused a lot on doing follow the money type of trainings so that we can really cripple these syndicates in a way that hurts them the most. Another thing my team and I have been working on is creating tech tools. So we've been developing this smartphone app, which actually is a species identification app, works on very simple questions. You need no biological or zoological knowledge and can be used by civil society as well as members of the public. It's available for free under the name of WildScan. So look it up. And personally, I have also supported police investigations by doing undercover buys in order to gather evidence for the police teams that we were working with. Now, over the years, my life, my path has intersected with that of many tigers, elephants, pangolins, tortoises, slow lorises, and so on. Sometimes alive, sometimes sadly not. But even though I consider myself more of an animal person rather than a people person, I have come to realize that humans are key to the survival of nature because we have overpowered so much of the planet that nothing can thrive without our goodwill. We as humans decide the quotas according to which an animal can be hunted for sport or not. We decide how far an animal can stray outside its designated territory before it's considered coming into conflict with humans and then probably killed or relocated. We decide which species and how many of them are going to be legally exploited for our needs, whether it's for our entertainment venues, whether it's for our medical needs. I mean, there's a whole list of things that we exploit wildlife for without paying back in any way. But the last year, which no one will ever forget, has shown us that the whole world can be brought to a standstill by a virus. And given this information, given that we are, we have all spent one whole year dealing with the aftermath of a zoonotic disease, I find it flabbergasting that there are still people out there, including conservationists, including policymakers, who still talk about, quote unquote, regulating the wildlife trade. Now, a virus is not going to care whether its host has entered the market legally or illegally. So every time there is commercial wildlife trade, whether it's in an exotic pet market, whether it is in a border crossing where wildlife is being trans, um, transmitted illegally or legally, whether you are sitting on a plane or in a boat and there's wildlife in the cargo legally or illegally, each of these instances is like putting yourself next to a ticking time bomb. And why would you want to do that? We need to really, really end commercial wildlife trade. Full stop. Now, when we say that, we get two main objections. The first one is, oh, what about people who are doing subsistence hunting? And, you know, we're not concerned about those issues. That's not what we're talking about. If someone is doing subsistence hunting to feed their families, that's not at all the person we're looking at. But if that same person starts supplying a middleman who then sends that animal or animal part up the supply chain, then that person who was originally doing subsistence hunting has now just become a foot soldier of the illegal wildlife trade and become part of the supply chain which could transmit diseases all over the world. And the second objection we hear is, what about people who have built businesses, sometimes for generations, on legally exploiting wildlife or wildlife parts. What about them? And to them, we say yes, true, they have been doing it legally, so they should not be immediately punished for that. 
But look at all the money being put out in the world today in the form of stimulus checks or economic recovery pack packages and so on. Why not divert some of that towards helping people and weaning them away from trades that commercially exploit wildlife? Because frankly, we cannot afford another pandemic. We simply cannot. But beyond that, my personal belief is that as humans, we need to stop seeing ourselves as owners and users of the planet and move more towards thinking of ourselves as co-passengers on this big round ship sailing through space and eventually what happens to one passenger is going to affect us all. I think that change in attitude would really help all of us. Thank you. Hello, I'm Casharina McKinney-Lambert and I am thrilled to be able to share some of the work that we're doing in the Bahamas to protect the waters around us and the livelihoods of people who depend on them. I'm the director of a Bahamian non-governmental organization called BRIEF, the Bahamas Reef Environment Educational Foundation, and I am joining you from the island of Eleuthera. BRIEF was established in 1993 with the mission of protecting the marine environment that sustains our way of life in the Bahamas. The ocean really is everything here. 95% of our country is underwater, so we like to think of ourselves as being a big ocean nation rather than a small island nation. Much of our work is focused on connecting people with the waters around us. We introduce thousands of young people to the marine environment every year. And for many of these children, it's their first time putting their head underwater in the sea and seeing a live coral reef. It's a life-changing experience and it opens up so many possibilities underwater and above. Brief works through hands-on and fins-on marine education. Education underpins everything that we do. We also work in public outreach, especially with fishermen, and working with fishermen for more sustainable fishing practices. And also research, particularly at our coral nurseries and regarding commercially important species and endangered marine species. We're also very involved with marine policy and advocacy, supporting the establishment of a network of effective marine protected areas that will help sustain our islands for future generations. We're very aware that there are special iconic places beloved to our people and to visitors to our shores that need special protection. Lighthouse Point on my home island is a really special example of this. We need to get creative. We need to work together to come up with solutions for how to live well on our low-lying, climate-vulnerable islands. What does sustainable development really mean in this context? What kind of tourism really makes sense here? And how can we be a model for others around the world? I am certainly inspired by the young people who are developing the tools to dig deep into these issues, who are bravely asking lots of questions, and who are pushing for science and good decision making. At Brief, we've also been an outspoken advocate of, uh, in favor of a moratorium on oil drilling in our pristine waters. Oil drilling is a clear and present threat that would jeopardize all the progress that we've made in marine conservation over the years and would also jeopardize the livelihoods of people who are dependent on a healthy ocean. We are certainly giving the ocean a voice. And now I'd like to share with you a short film that mentions some of the conservation challenges that we are addressing and that highlights the work that we're doing through our Eco Schools program in particular um, to protect the waters around us. As a child growing up on the beautiful island of Eleuthera, I think I spent more time underwater than above. 
The Bahamas is a low-lying chain of islands spread over 100,000 square miles of ocean. We are on the forefront of the climate emergency, particularly vulnerable to sea level rise and to increasingly strong hurricanes. BRIEF is the Bahamas Reef Environment Educational Foundation. We have a vision of a country where all people understand the waters around us and take action to protect them. Coral reefs are particularly important in the Bahamas because they are a home for many of our commercially important fish species. They also play a critical role protecting our islands from storms and hurricanes. Intact reefs can break wave energy by 97%. Our fragile coral reefs are particularly vulnerable to the warming waters. When corals get stressed, they lose the algae that lives in their tissues and they appear white. If this bleaching continues for too long, they can die. At our coral nurseries, briefs giving the coral a helping hand. Growing coral floating in the water column that we can then outplant back onto the reef to help restore the reef in nearby areas. Brief created the Coral Reef Sculpture Garden to draw attention to threats facing our marine environment. Ocean Atlas is the largest underwater sculpture in the world, and since we put it into the water a few years ago, it is turning into a live reef. Entire ecosystems are under threat. For many of our important species, we're eating these fish faster than they're able to reproduce. The Nassau grouper and queen conch are so important here, and in the Bahamas is where we have some of the last remaining populations of these species. We're working to create a fully functional network of marine protected areas, essential for the social, economic, and ecological future of our country. Brief runs a program called Eco Schools in the Bahamas that challenges young people to observe the environment around them and take action to protect it. They're able to explore the mangroves and go snorkeling on coral reefs to discover the tremendous biodiversity and life beneath the waters. Deep Creek Middle School was the first eco school in the Bahamas. These children have developed an eco-code that everyone in the school follows. They have eliminated single-use plastics from their campus. They're out in the field collecting water samples and monitoring the environment around them, and then communicating their findings to their community at large. There are currently 31 eco-schools in the Bahamas, and these children here are joining a network of 69 countries around the world that encompass 19 and a half million children. We are building a whole new generation of environmental stewards, and I'm so proud of what these young people are achieving. There's so much that needs to be done to protect the incredibly beautiful Bahamian waters for future generations. And it all starts with education. Now that we've heard from the protectors, uh, we're going to get into conversation with them right now. Well, let's start with this whole idea of um, changing the idea of exploration. Um, it's the Explorers Club. <clears throat> what we're trying to do is not only bring people into the Explorers Club to sort of alter its identity, but to really get people to think differently about the whole idea of exploration, to remove this notion of territory, to remove this notion 
of, frankly, the extension of influence, uh, to try to look at exploration as something that individuals can do within an individual sphere um, and to grow that whole idea. So I am curious to hear uh, from you guys how you might see yourself as explorers when you remove this idea of territory, remove this idea of um, land from exploration. Uh, and I will start with, um, since it's on my screen this way, uh, Supraja. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's truly an honor to be presenting my work today at the Explorers Club 50. Um, thank you, Joe, for nominating me. And uh, I work along the east coast of India, along the Bay of Bengal, and we work on a community-based sea turtle conservation. It started as a community-based sea turtle conservation, but now we've expanded it to marine conservation. And um, uh, we work along approximately 700 kilometers, covering three states, um, Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, and Odisha. And uh, we work along 222 fishing villages, and we have sea turtle protection force members who are from the marginalized fishing community and from the tribal community. Uh, most of them are school dropouts. And uh, some of them were earl earlier uh, turtle egg poachers and turtle poachers who are now working as dedicated sea turtle protection force members. And um, what started initially as just conservation of the sea turtle species um, moved on to a larger uh, spectrum because we realized that uh, when we are doing patrolling on the beach, it's uh, not enough just to protect the uh, nesting beaches and the turtles that come to nest and watch over hatchlings that are going to sea. But the larger issue is at sea, where the turtles are spending most of their lives. And uh, it's the fishermen who are interacting with the sea turtles, literally on a daily basis when they're going on their fishing activities. So we started focusing a lot on um, uh, fishermen who are going to sea. And when you say exploration, it's like, um, for me, it's like when I, every time I go on the boat and I'm at sea, it's like an exploration. And uh, it's quite tough. Going on the boat is a very, it's a very interesting uh, experience, but going on a commercial trawl fisherman is a harrowing experience. Um, I don't know how it is in other countries, but in, in India, um, because of the way the things are, it's the smell of the diesel and the stench of rotting fish, it just um, makes you feel so seasick but it's for the love of sea turtles and for the work that we do I managed to go on the trawl boats but it's uh, I love going on being on the ocean uh, going on the boat because um, when you say it's it's something very um, new it's like um, when you're on the sea you can only see the surface you you don't know what's happening inside and there's a lot of surprises out there for you it's like suddenly you see some fish jumping or a pod of dolphins coming by and then you want to know what dolphins are these, what species are they and what are they doing, are they mulling or they're just moving or they're feeding. So all that is there. It's very interesting. And uh, the most important work that we've recently started doing the last uh, four years, we've concentrated, we're concentrating on retrieving ghost nets because that's a huge problem. And yes, yes. Uh, we have... We have our, our uh, sea turtle protection force members and the community uh, fishermen who share a lot of videos and uh, photos with us. Like they see whenever they see any mass floating, they take their boat towards uh, the mass and uh, they see if there are any species, endangered species entangled in it. And mm -hmm. then they cut the net, they release the turtles or any other species. And if there's a small piece of um, post net, they bring it back. If it's very large and they're not able to pull it into their boat, they're not bringing it back. That's a very sad thing. And that's yeah. something that we are working on this year to see what can be done. How can we bring it back? So that's a huge issue that we are working on now. So I just have one question. You started out as a philosopher. 
a philosopher. And so I wonder now that you've made this journey, this is an exploration. It certainly is a personal journey from one thought about a kind of destiny to a, a very different place than you would have thought you would be when you started. And do you perceive still a connection, a, 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 a way to bring together the philosophy that you studied in school and the actions that you take today? Uh, I'm a, I did my philosophy, uh, but I'm an artist by profession, Joe. I run an art studio and you could see some of the paintings behind me. So my journey is very uh, varied, like uh, art is my bread and butter and the conservation work is my lifeline. And uh, when you ask me what's the relationship, what's the journey from philosophy to the conservation, as uh, I mentioned uh, earlier in my documentary or in my presentation also, um, I've always wanted to know what the purpose of my life was. That was what led me to study philosophy. And when you try to see yourself in the other, when you see yourself, that's when you understand the pain and you can feel. So that's when you, uh, so that's taken me on this journey and mm -hmm. the conservation work. My connection with the ocean has uh, made me continue this work. Whatever challenges, whatever difficulties, whatever is there and the surprises, the awe and wonder also, the awe and yeah. wonder. Yeah, yeah. So because of this idea of starting in one place and moving to another, I want to go to Generia uh, next, because of course, you also have this profound change from what we all think of a Samburu or a Maasai uh, Moran as being, uh, to now a very, very different mission with the conservation of lions. And I wonder if you can talk about how this meaning, this is a profound thing, uh, a profound cultural idea that has to be changed uh, and that you've participated in this change. So many of you are working in a motif of reverses, reversal, undoing. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm curious um, how, you, how you see the relationship, how manhood, responsibility, uh, the, the values that used to lead a, a warrior to go out and kill a lion, how these now transfer to the conservation of lions. Thank you so much. Um, first, hello everyone. I'm very excited to be part of this. I'm so, so thrilled and I'm saying thank you so much. Um, I live in Kenya and especially in Northern Kenya where my community is mainly pastoralist communities why they keep livestock like goats and cows. And that is their wealthy. That is their wealth. That's their bank. And when we started the Welsh Lions, I, I did hit lions myself, just the same as my community as well, because of praying our livestock, of what we depend on for in life. But when I joined the Welsh Lions, that's when I realized what is actually happening with lions. Yes, we know how many lions we have killed, but how many lions are actually there in Kenya? How many lions are here in our homeland. And what does that mean to us? And that is when I realized that lions are going in a serious threat, that if nothing will be done, I think we are losing even our own culture because a lot of our culture related to these lions, to this wildlife. We have been conservationists from day one. It's not that the Samburu community or the Maasai are just conservation just recently. But the thing was that we are seeing the other side of the picture. We are seeing lions as a problem animal. We're seeing elephant. We're seeing like just different perspective of, of these wildlife, but we have never like actually gone out and really studied them, seeing how social these wildlife are. And they are contributing so much in our own lifetime. And that is when I realized being a Samburu warrior, being circumcised and given a different role within my culture and my society is actually to protect our livestock, our community, against anything attack, any livestock being attacked by lions. And that is when I said, if we need to, to really save lions, we need to bring this demographic group of warriors into lion conservation because that there is army within the culture. 
they are the one to be told that something has happened there. The lion have afraid something. And you'll see them spear themselves into the bush with the spears and shoot that lion. And that is when I said, well, oh, for me, I want to like to be circumcised and become a warrior. And after those 15 years of age, I wanted to actually show how brave I am by killing lions. But that knowledge that I, we used to kill lions, uh, the, the, that knowledge that we are using now to protect lions. And that is when everyone was like, oh, wow, if warriors, if these young generations are the one spearheaded themselves, and when we first like joined that program, we thought we were being spied by telling other people that my community, someone have killed a lion there. But it wasn't that. It wasn't that negativity that we used to have in our mindset. It is actually to say, how can we solve this problem mm. without mm. before happening? How can we control lions killing a cow before they, that happened? By doing so, you have saved a lion and you have, you have saved a cow or a goat. And then also looking at surrounding, like all the environment, what then lions need in order to stop killing our lifestyle? Then we realize that all these wildlife that we are aiming just to practice ourselves are actually food for lions. And that was the problem. If lion doesn't have food, then of course they will come and demand for our lifestyle. And that is when we brought the Warrior Watch program yeah. to become yeah. the ambassadors of lion conservation. And from 11 lions, we are now up, we are about 100 now which is about That's 60. Great. So we are really moving. And that is a very cool thing because no any elder within our culture will go out and hunt lions. It's actually the young generation that have been given that role. But once the young generation will go out before they release their livestock for grazing and spot where the lions are and put some tag collars and say, okay, you need to avoid this area because this is where the lions are hiding today. Mm -hmm. By doing so, Spreading that awareness back to the community, you have saved their livestock, you have saved your lion. And from then, now we have resident lion in an area where the lions have never been seen for that years, which is really exciting now. Yeah, that's great. So, that's great. Yeah. Very cool. So, so then I'm going to jump to Onkuri because of this idea again about this transfer of um, going from attacking and killing an animal to working to save an animal. You deal with poachers, you deal with traffickers. Uh, how often do you, Onkuri, um, come across people who undergo a change of heart? Um, I have to be a little bit um, brutally frank here. Yeah. <laughs> if we're talking about people who are doing it just to eke out a livelihood, then yes, offering them an alternative source of livelihood, you know, something that uh, allows them not to go into the forest and poach either animals or even collect rare plants or chop a valuable tree. It's a tough life. So if you give them something that's easier and more profitable, certainly they will take it. But most of my work has been more with the, like the hardcore criminals so for them, the amount of money, the ratio of profit to risk is so high that it's very difficult to change their minds just by appealing to their heart or by appealing to the thing of, oh, you know, what's going to happen when all these animals are gone? Because, uh, you know, as we just heard from Janaria, for people who have a culture of interacting with the animals, you can change their minds by saying you're going to lose your culture when these animals are gone. But for a lot of the poachers and traffickers we're dealing with, the, especially the peoples who are dealing with, uh, you know, commodities that don't expire very easily, like hard, dry commodities, I would say, like tusks or pangolin scales or rhino horn. They are actually banking on the extinction of the species mm. because that will... Uh, raise the value of their stockpiles. You know, we've seen a lot of cases where they've got huge stockpiles of elephant ivory or rhino horn or pangolin scales. They're not releasing them into the market or they're releasing it in very controlled quantities because they're waiting for the animal to become extremely rare or almost extinct in the wild. And then when they release it, there'll be a greater demand and higher price for their commodity. So for people like that who are in their 
purely just to make money and they're making really good money it's uh, you know you can't really change their minds in any other way rather th- other than showing them that you can't make money off it and usually the guys at the top are not the ones who are getting their hands dirty doing the actual killing and transporting you know like any business it's the people at the top who make the most money so that's why we've been focusing a lot on our you know in our law enforcement support work in going after the money because when you see is the assets of these syndicates uh, either just the cash itself or whatever property jewelry vehicles land whatever they've bought with the cash from their wildlife trafficking profits that's when they actually get rattled and that's what changes their mind when they don't have such high profits because it changes the risk reward diagram oh absolutely because right now you see it's so much more easy and fun to be a trafficker than it is to be on the good side you know if you want to even take your pet dog across international borders you got to fill in hundreds of forms and get the correct tickets and everything whereas if you want to traffic a illegal wild animal you just bribe a couple of people in most parts of the world and it'll get done Mm-hmm. so it's way 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 easier and more rewarding you get paid quicker you get get paid more you make faster connections and more efficient networks with people if you're a criminal than if you're a person who's trying to stop the criminals so we're trying to change that yeah 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 very really i mean i don't know i mean obviously within our circles we are familiar with the scale of the wildlife trade but i still think the general public is not quite aware of the scale of the global trade in um illegal wildlife uh materials which is really just a vast uh yes. criminal enterprise so it it I, i mean it simply must be very dangerous work Um uh, if you're asking me personally actually it's more dangerous when you see it on TV because in real life an investigation which you and in a TV episode you might see happening in half an hour one hour yeah. in real life it could be spread out over years actually so you know there could be a few moments of excitement and then a few months when nothing happens because you're waiting for intelligence to come in you've got to develop that intelligence you've got to analyze it <laughs> even if you have a lot of intel it actually has to be actionable in the sense there has to be some actual violation of law that a mandated agency can act upon and even then we are encouraging agencies not to just do an arrest or a seizure of commodities and let it go but make sure you have enough evidence to actually get a conviction and or seize assets otherwise it's just a waste of time frankly So this is another I'm going to jump over to Kazarina um because I think uh, you know the Bahamas um you've worked and lived most of your your life I know um from some association with the Bahamas about uh the frictions between conch fishermen and you know conch and reef preservation um and your work deals exactly in this sort of ocean conservation modus vivendi ways that people can find to live and work and preserve some level of um of um a life that they recognize and yet at the same time with the numbers of people that we have everywhere a lot of these um traditional lifestyles uh conch fishing for example hit a get, come up against this kind of wall how often do you run into this and is it it must be within the sphere of what you're dealing with but i imagine at the other end you know you have climate change you have all kinds of forces impinging on the life of the sea uh in these uh shallow ocean environments yeah absolutely so first of all thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this it's really an honor and i'm i'm thrilled to be here and um you know we're always thinking about you know how do we use the environment how do we benefit from the environment but how do we use it without using it up um and how can we use really good science to help make decisions how do we how do we make science based decisions um that people are on board with um and you know the conch is a great example i mean when i was a little girl we'd go out and we'd catch so many conch to the point where the boat was low in the water because we caught so many conch 
Um, and nowadays they're really hard to find. Um, and fishermen are having to go further and further afield and use more and more gas. Um, and as a result, are often taking smaller illegal conch um, because that's all that they can find close by. Um, so really thinking about, you know, what's going on in neighboring countries. And I'm excited to be talking with all of you to be, you know, sharing knowledges, sharing experiences um, and learning from examples of elsewhere. In the Bahamas, we learned from Florida, um, they lost their conch population. Um, and we're always saying we want to make sure we don't do the same thing. Um, but sort of tying that in with your, your initial question about what does it mean to be an explorer? Um, I think we can all be explorers. And um, we do a lot of work at Brief introducing young people to the environment, um, to the marine environment, putting their heads underwater for the first time. And it sounds crazy, but as an archipelago, um, a lot of our population don't know how to swim yet. Um, yet is my favorite word, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it's hard to get excited about protecting something that you're scared of. And so we do a lot of work dispelling some of those fears of the ocean, dispelling fears of sharks. Um, sharks are now protected in the Bahamas and involving young people in collecting information and being producers of knowledge and not just consumers of knowledge. So mm. just going back to the conch question, We've done a number of projects working with young people to go out and survey conch middens, piles of old conch shells, um, mm. and getting young people involved in collecting information that then is used to make good decisions. Um, and we're thinking on small scales and specific species, but then also thinking about marine protected areas. Um, the Bahamas is committed to 20% marine protected areas by... <laughs> 2020, the end of last year, and we're trying to get that fully implemented now. Um, but there's there's a lot more that needs to be done. And we need to be thinking about um, actually making these areas effectively protected as well as just protected on paper. Um, but public involvement and being part of the solution and being part of the data collection um, and being an explorer in the environment that we want to protect um, is really what it's all about. So let me jump over to Callie as well. And I'm going to start with the explorer question because what you do is unique in the context of what we're talking about, uh, you know, in the personal arc and then the discovery of possibility. And then, of course, food being key to many of these discussions, how you see yourself fitting in this uh, puzzle. Yeah. Um, well, I think that my idea of explorer was really shaped by the seven years that I spent working at National Geographic. And uh, and I guess, first of all, thank you. Yeah, thank you for having, having us all on here. It's really cool to be together as a group um, after seeing everyone's faces in the Explorers Club TEC 50 booklet. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I, I worked at National Geographic Kids for about seven years. And over that time, I saw people coming in through those doors who were uh, you know, artists, exploration technologists, um, drone pilots, they were uh, scuba divers, but also people who, who worked kind of behind the scenes. And so my idea of an explorer was really shaped by that. And I think it's at Nat Geo, it's been a, a long time since the old idea, the kind of romanticized idea of an explorer has been shed. Um, it used to mean things finding out things that are new to white Western society. Right. And uh, now that we are all so connected, that word needed to be redefined. And so now it means exploring things that are new to science, new to humanity, new ways of thinking, um, you know, exploring our own cultures from within. And, um, and so I think that I, I, I do see myself fitting into that. Um, in that, you know, I, I am definitely exploring a new way of, of uh, supporting conservation. Uh, I, I think that previously um, in the conservation world, uh, as, as conservation organizations are looking for funders to, uh, to promote the protection of these wild places, they, uh, the, the most common sense thing to do is to go to the people who have the most money and mm -hmm. and to go to the people who uh, can reliably donate and um and so that that usually means adults and you know major donors and 
kids and youth don't necessarily fall into a bracket that you would think of as a donor class. And I just felt that we were missing out on a big opportunity with that because they're half of the world. Literally the median age is 31 years old right now. And so to not be asking that group of people to, uh, to participate in conservation is not only, I think, short-sighted, you know, we're missing out on cultivating young, young givers, young donors right. early, um, but also just we don't have time to ignore half right. of the planet that, that could be participating. So, um, so yeah, I think that what I'm doing is maybe exploring a new idea Obviously we have, um, we get the opportunity to literally explore wild places as well um, in our work with uh, supporting scientists yeah. who are working in Ecuador. And so there's, there's some, some old fashioned exploration involved as well, but. And, and um, have you been doing this long enough now? I know it's quite a few years to see young people go from, um, I guess you'd consider it a student or an initiate to an effective actor in the conservation scene. Have you seen this happen uh, with people that you've been engaged with? Yeah, well, I, it hasn't been that long. I I left Nat Geo in the fall of 2019. So oh, okay, that's shorter than I thought. Yeah. Yeah. So we um, we've been working for the last year and a half, and we're still working on on our flagship project, which is to create the world's first entirely entirely youth funded nature reserve. Um, but definitely I had, uh, when we first launched, I just had a bunch of young people reach out to say, how can I help? Is there something I can do? I don't, I don't really have any money or, uh, or know really how I can help, but I love this idea and I want to be part of it. And so um, this has turned much more into a youth mentoring scheme than I imagined from at the beginning, but that's become the most rewarding part of it. Um, you have young people who are part of our youth council, which is this, this body of about 60 young people from around the world. Um, and they, they came to me saying, I want to help, don't know what to do. And then we uh, work together to think of what are their strengths? How can they use their strengths to turn that into something that could ultimately uh, be used for conservation? So for example, um, we have one youth council member who's in the UK, his name is James McCullough, and he is, I think at 17 years old, he has already identified 3,700 species of invertebrates within the UK. So this is a person with an incredible amount of knowledge about uh, a topic, and he didn't really know how that could be converted into raising funds for this land purchase. And so uh, what he wound up doing is going around his neighborhood and asking his neighbors if they would let him bioblitz their backyards in return for a donation. And so mm. he not only got to expand his list of invertebrates that he'd found and contribute to science in his community um, through the local recording, but also was able to um, generate a few hundred dollars for the reserve. And, um, and yeah, so I think, I think that redefining what is financial power is, um, is an important part of what we do and helping people find that through their strengths and, and talents is part of it. So that, that thing about redefining power interests me too, because that's another one of these sort of the, ex, you know, the whole tradition of exploration sort of starts back in the day with governmental power, imperial power, et cetera, extending itself out across the world. And this is so much about redirecting um, power uh, to grassroots, you know, popular levels of activity. And everyone says, we know this now, you can't really do this job uh, without having it work effectively at, at the local level. You have to have the people on the ground um, do this work. And, and again, people tend to dismiss children as being not effective players in this realm. Um, uh, Supraja, you've mentioned several times about the fact that these communities you work with are um, undervalued within society. Um, is there something 
and I'll go back to you for this first. Is there a change in self-perception that you see when, and actually I think Gennaro, Gennaro would also have a, a thing to say, there's a, 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 when people discover their power, there, there can be a kind of um, acceleration, a kind of mm -hmm. speeding up uh, once yeah. they understand, oh, I do have power, I can do a thing. That means I can do two things, and that means I can do five things, and that means I can do 12 things. Um, and it sort of, it, it, it takes off. Um, have you seen that kind of phenomena, Supraja? And I'll go to others as well. Yes, of course. Um, because most often, um, they always, the, most of these uh, members have an inferiority complex, but by involving themselves in this conservation program and uh, by getting all the local administrators and celebrities coming to watch the hashlings emerge and all that, so the, it's given them a kind of a local pride and a recognition. Um, earlier, you know, they were as uh, because of their uh, economically backward situation, uh, they always thought that they were not, uh, they were lacking in something. But now when people from the city or others come and ask them about the ocean, because they have a wealth of knowledge on the ocean, because they may not have a degree, but they have experience. So they have got the pride and this recognition as a sea turtle protection force member or involving in marine conservation has given them that uh, pride. And uh, with this recognition, whatever you are saying, I've observed it in many of our uh, members. Uh, they have the little uh, support has uh, and recognition has given them um, a lot of, uh, they sit and think for themselves and try to innovate and improvise and make the program wonderful in their own different ways. Like, uh, like last week, we had one of our members bringing the local um, businessman to come and release hatchlings because he thought if he comes, then um, he's also one of the uh, very prominent persons in the local port, nearby port. So he came and released the hatchlings. So this gives a, a life-changing experience for that businessman. So it's like this. And uh, some members, they bring uh, children to come and release the hatchlings. So it's making a life-changing experience in each child who's watching that uh, the hatchling uh, release. So it really makes a lot of difference. And um, when fishermen are sharing videos and photographs of um, them cutting the nets and releasing the turtles is really, really very heartening for us because uh, in South India, where we work, uh, if anybody took a turtle onto their boat, they consider, some of them consider a turtle as a bad omen. So they would never pull up a turtle onto their boat. But mm. when I'm seeing them going towards a ghost net, and pulling the net onto their boat, cutting the net and then releasing. Sometimes, you know, letting the turtle recoup, pouring some water on its head and then releasing it back. It makes me feel really, really uh, happy. And I feel like uh, it's that this change is what we were working so hard for all these years. So I think and the, the other thing is um, the our members are role models for the children in their village and they look up to them. And uh, that's why we also tell our, give them a lot of training and tell our conservation coordinators and our sea turtle protection force members, they have to be very careful in what they talk and how they uh, portray things because children are always watching and absorbing things like uh, information from them, like small sponges. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, I want to do sort of, um, a slice through a day in the field. We talked about that, a day in the field. Uh, and I'm going to start with Onkuri, a day. What is a day like for you? Well, there are lots of different types of days, but let me describe a typical day at a training. Let's say it's a ranger training that we're doing somewhere in a protected area. So it would start at about dawn because there's a lot of lesson prep to be done and we do very, very hands-on uh, training. So there's usually like one hour of theory followed by practical exercises the whole day. So it would start at dawn, I'd meet my team, everyone knows their roles for the day, we set up the lessons, um, make sure there's no tech glitches and the PowerPoint runs well. 
And then we move out into the field and that's when the excitement starts because we make them practice in real world scenarios. So if they're doing first aid, for example, we will actually get someone to act wounded and they'll have to pick that person up and carry them, you know, fireman's lift and trying to make a makeshift um, stretcher out of forest materials and so on. If they are doing, if they're practicing how to do a raid, like let's say they know there's a trader who's meeting another trafficker in a hotel room, then we'll actually hire actors to act as those two traffickers. And they'll have been briefed as to what kind of responses to give, um, you know, how they should be searched and so on. And so then the police team we're training will actually go and execute everything we've taught them. Like they'll finish their casework, they'll make their raid plan, they'll draw a little map, they'll have a plain clothes team, they'll have a uniform team. Each one will have their own role, how to communicate with each other, what to do if something goes wrong. And uh, then they'll go and arrest. And, you know, usually that happens okay. But sometimes we try and throw a little wrench in the works just to make sure they are remembering everything we've taught them. We'll tell the actors, you know, just clam up, don't say anything, then see, do they get threatening? Do they actually try to search the, the room correctly and gather physical evidence? Or are they just trying to bully their way into getting verbal uh, confessions from the actors? Um, sometimes, of course, a little wrench gets thrown into the works that we haven't planned for. Like one time we were doing this training in a town in central India and the hotel where we were doing this raid the receptionist had not been told by the hotel owner that this is a police training and, you know, nothing serious is going on. So he thought there was an actual raid going on and actual criminals there. And he called the actual cops and they came, you know, oh, madam, oh. what is happening? Do you need our support? <laughs> and so that was exciting. And, uh, and then, you know, what's, what I find really interesting is that the people, the actors who are acting as criminals, even though they know their actors, even though the students know their actors, even though we as instructors know their actors, it's really interesting to see how their body language changes. They actually start looking guilty, even though they're not professional actors. You know, we haven't told them act guilty. We've just told them you'll be sitting in a room and the police will come and arrest you. And then you give them this story if they ask you these questions. But they actually get that guilty body language and, you know, they clam up and, you know, they get very tense and uh, that's interesting and that to me says that the way you treat someone the the role you cast them in in your mm -hmm. mind that's the role they start playing in real life for you even yeah, when yeah. everyone knows that we are all acting yeah uh, very and then interesting. The, most, the most fun thing of course is when we do the mock court cases and the mock cross-examination we take a very experienced lawyer along She's a super tough um, litig litigation lawyer. And um, I mean, she starts asking these guys questions, you know, on their case papers, even though, again, everyone knows it's a setup and everyone knows we are training and it's all acting. You can see them visibly start sweating and getting very angry. And, you know, I have been doing this job for 20 years. How dare you question me, <laughs> you know, even though they're acting. And uh, so that's, that's really interesting to me. And that, that sort of tells me that even in real life, when we go out and we're actually doing this thing against criminals, if you're casting them as villains, then they will act like villains, but mm -hmm. give them an opportunity to say, hey, okay, fine, you know, I made a mistake or, okay, show me another way to do things. Mm -hmm. I was just doing it to feed my family, whatever it is, then they'll take that route and maybe make everyone's lives easier. I mean, just the whole theater of that, I find completely fascinating. Okay, so Callie, slice a day in a life. Oh my gosh, yeah. Again, completely different depending on, on the month. Um, I would say the average day in the life is sitting at my computer, working out the administrative details behind having a nonprofit organization, which in the US is extremely complicated right. and involves a ton of paperwork. Um, it's probably 50% that and then 50% working with our youth council who are divided into committees. And so they, they have officers and each officer kind of takes charge of a certain element of what we do. And so I'm communicating with them a lot every day. 
um, and then with our partners as well. So that those days are getting the work done um, and it's still really good fun. But uh, the, the best days are being on expedition. So a day in the life on an expedition is completely different. Um, when, when we go down to uh, this, this reserve that we're working on right now, which is called Dracula Reserve, and it's, it's an expansion of an existing reserve in Ecuador that's yeah. uh, it's a, a corridor that's being pieced together with funding from, um, from the Orchid Conservation Alliance, Rainforest Trust, uh, University of Basel, um, and, and others. And so we are contributing a piece to that. And so when we go down, we join up with our Ecuadorian partner, uh, Fundacion Ecominga, and their partner scientists who are from the National Institute of Biodiversity in Ecuador. And, uh, and so we go out into the field with them and we'll camp for like five to 10 days, depending on the location. And uh, while you're out there, um, you have to hike in, which is grueling. Um, the last expedition, we were hiking into the center of our site and we hadn't, no one had really been there before to this location. So we hiked in and I thought it took the entire day. I mean, it took, it probably was an eight hour hike, nine hour hike or something. And I thought, God, we must've gone, that's gotta be at least like seven miles or something through this. It was like less than two. It was so, <laughs> it was it's brutal. Um, so the hike will make you go jelly lagged. Um, for me, it's making sure all of our batteries are charged. All of the camera pieces, lenses uh, are in an accessible place and that I've packed away the right things and kept the right ones on me. Um, and then a lot of photographing, stopping to photograph minuscule orchids. So you have to be on these hikes, you have to be prepared to photograph macro. Uh, right. or the orchids that are on this site are so tiny. I mean, a, in a millimeter to two millimeters. Wow. Um, and in order to photograph that with, with any level of detail, you have to use external light. So it's not just a camera and a macro lens. You also have to have a light set up. But yeah. we're also trying to photograph, you know, if we come across the spider monkeys, so critically endangered species, I've been twice now and haven't seen them, um, then you have to be prepared with your telephoto lens to see them as well. So... Right. It's a lot of gear, um, a lot of switching lenses and things like that. Um, but it's always worth it. Like when you stumble across a snake or you, you're, um, you know, walking in the middle of the night with your flashlight and a headlamp and you see a glass frog on, on a fern. Um, yeah. Those yeah, moments yeah. of discovery and of, um, I mean that in a light sense, like of finding yeah. something that yeah. are the little bits of thrill. Um, and occasionally when we're lucky, we'll actually have a real discovery of a new species to science, which happens more often. Yeah, more than often than think. people think. Yeah. Um, I do have to ask, why is it called the Dracula Reserve? So there's a genus of orchid called, uh, oh, Dra okay. it's a Dracula genus. And, okay. um, and yeah, they're, they're really interesting looking. They have these long spikes coming off the petals. So, um, there are a few different different um, explanations as to why that has that name, but Dr Count Dracula, it's supposed to kind of reminisce of his pointy collar, but the word oh. Dracula actually means little dragon. Yes. And so, uh, so there we go. Yeah, so it's named for those orchids. Kazarina, what is a day in your life? Oh my goodness, so much. <laughs> um, so certainly as, as Callie had mentioned, um, you know, running an organization has a lot of um, the behind the scenes part, um, which I really enjoy because I enjoy engaging with stakeholders on, on lots of different levels. Um, but at Brief, we do we, a lot of policy and advocacy, um, working on environmental regulations and really trying to make the Bahamas um, the best little country in the world um, that can be a model for elsewhere when we're thinking about regulations for development, for how we're addressing climate change. Um, we're certainly one of the most climate vulnerable countries in the entire world. Um, the highest point in our country is only 206 feet above sea level. 
And um, we're also in a, in a hurricane zone. So, you know, thinking about what kind of development makes sense for our country um, for now, but also thinking a few generations in the future. So I'm very involved on that, that policy side, thinking about the sustainable development goals um, and working in, in collaboration with local and international NGOs and our government. Um, I spend quite a bit of time reviewing environmental impact assessments um, thinking, uh, the Bahamas has been in the news recently um, on a number of topics. Um, oil exploration has been uh, a big uh, threat to our waters. Um, this is something that we have been very vocal uh, about, thinking it's not the way forward, obviously because of climate change, um, but also um, because of the threat of pollution to our neighbors. Um, and also thinking about what kind of makes sense in tourism, um, what kind of tourism um, works for our islands. Um, there's a lot of discussion going on about that. I hope we can talk at another time about that as well. Um, but then I also love being in the field. Um, and this is a powerful part of my work. Um, I look forward to talking more with Janaria about the synergies and the sort of parallels between lions and sharks, talking about top predators and how we can um, protect these species that are so important for the ecosystem. So introdu introducing kids to sharks is something I love to do. And um, thinking about this trajectory that um, young people can get on. Uh, we work closely with the Cape Eleuthera Island School at the southern um, end of, of Eleuthera, the island where I was born. Um, yeah. And we had some students who've been in these programs who, when they started, um, we run a program called the Bahamas Environmental Steward Scholars Program. These kids didn't know how to swim when they started. And at the end, they're out joining us on research expeditions, studying spawning aggregations of critically important species and um, getting involved with our coral nursery. So lots of, lots of things go on in, in a single day. And um, and it all comes together um, in what we do. Okay, so Janaria, what is one day like from dawn to probably rather late at night? <laughs> yeah, um, yes, we have a lot of responsibilities that we have to deal with, um, especially in these rural areas where it's very dry. So my day life is very different. One day I might be depending on how far I'm going because I'm working in nine other conservancies. So, and my, my main objective is how can we bring lions in these areas where they used to be, but they are no longer there. Like in some of these nine conservancies, which is a very big, big area, um, only two of those actually are very adjacent to the two reserves that we have very close in this region, which is Samburu National Reserve and Chaba National Reserve. So those are very close reserves, which are very tiny. They are not enough for a uh, big population of lions. So when we started with one lion in this region, so I wanted to see how can lions like go from one area rather than being in one place and causing huge conflict or killing so many cows. So my day day work is actually to work with the community to bring the memories of the, the old, you know, elders, the women, the children back to land conservation. What was all about land conservation? Uh, how did you in the, all these years from centuries have lands and have cows here? Why can't we just have that? But it is just two or nine that the, my community have believed that yes, there is a climate change. Now we experience a whole year drought and that is very difficult with land conservation. Yes, lands, yeah, that, I don't mean that they eat grass, but uh, if there's no any other habitats, then of course they will prey on livestock. So I go for workshop main of the time. A lot of the time is to hold a workshop of elders just now after Corona that I'm not allowed like to do all that. Uh, but now I do like four lands and respond to conflict. So my car doesn't last that, that long because sometimes yeah. I drive like an, an ambulance because before the community take their actions, I have to be there to control them and say, yes, I really understand how you feel. I totally understand. I have cows just like you. And I really know how you feel because sometimes you come across an elder or someone have only one cow and that cow is dead. And we don't have any potential to 
do compensation or anything. And we don't believe compensation in, in our culture uh, because mm. we believe that if you have five cows, 10 cows, one must be killed by lion and one must go under the dish and, you know, broke his leg. And one must, your friend must come and, you know, borrow it and you give him because he doesn't know. So we have a very strong culture. So that culture is what that have keep lions from like century up to now. It is just now that things are changing because of education and because of uh, so many other things. That, yeah. That's why I'm working so hard now with the little children. Also to show those who have not been to school that you have responsibilities. And now if you take your livestock in there, then if you see lion trucks, this is how you can really be very vigilant. We are working now with the domestic dogs. So my work now is very hard to see how mm. I can mobilize my community to really live alongside lion conservation. And that is the really hard, unless the conflict has happened in some areas. And that is when sometimes uh, we get really far communities that are not resident of this area that are just moving up and down because it's just a free land. So you have to go back because they still, they still have in that their mind that we have to kill a lion. And also some of the lion skin are used for ceremony purposes. Right. So mm -hmm. if those communities from far comes, then I have to be like, go back from day one of my life to really explain that, you know, there are only few lions that you think in this region. There are this number of lions, less than 2,000 in Kenya. And if we lose this, then we're losing part of our life. So mm -hmm. it, mine is just to keep generating and bring more warriors. That is my work now uh, because I'm, I'm now an elder. So I'm bringing new generation of warriors into land conservation. And I'm glad that I've got all around. So all I do is just community and bring more community on board. The mama Simba, the women's and the kids and also the, the elders then also responding conflict and make sure that I follow each and every land that is around me because that is very important to our, our ecosystem. You might think it was difficult to relate to this, but a neighbor's goat where I live was killed by a mountain lion and eaten about 100 feet from the tip of my finger right now. Oh, over my there. God. Oh so that's because of drought. There's drought. It forces the lions down where the people live. Uh -huh. I live in yeah. the country. Um, there's livestock, um, wow. you know, and so this is a, not a, an isolated uh, problem. Uh, yeah. I want to go to Supraja uh, for a slice through a day in the life, and then we're going to wrap up. My day starts very early uh, during the turtle season. That is from December to June. Um, it's very, very hectic. And uh, we work through the night because, as everybody knows, hatchlings uh, emerge during the night and even turtles come and nest during the night. So we have to stay up and uh, we work during the night and uh, early morning and then take a little bit of rest uh, in the forenoon, like in the morning and then have to start off. I have to start off doing my paperwork because as um, Kali and Kasharina said, uh, an organization, running an organization is not so easy. And uh, because we work with endangered species, we have a lot of uh, governmental permissions and meeting of officers and uh, all the environment uh, enforcement departments. But I would say I never know what my day holds. Uh, holes. And um, as uh, it, there's a lot of awe and wonder also in every day. And when I wake up, because there might be a rescue or there might be a, somebody is calling me to say there are a pod of dolphins going by, would you like to come by and watch? So we take a boat and follow them and take some photographs. So because that's uh, something that we would like to do later on to study uh, the dolphins and find out if they are a resident population. Uh, we have uh, four different species of dolphins offshore. And um, so my day is uh, really, really uh, very uh, varied and uh, it, there's no routine. So that's really interesting for me. And we have a lot of fishermen sharing uh, their views, their photographs and videos. And uh, if there is a rescue, the day is really, really long because we have to attend to the injured turtle and uh, we have to take it to the veterinary uh, college. We have to check out what the problem is, what's the cause of injury, and uh, the treatment schedule and all those things. But uh, 
if we i believe that if you enjoy what you're doing every moment of it is really wonderful a wonderful learning experience so it never makes you feel tired because a lot of people ask me this question aren't you tired but i think when you love what you're doing you can never uh, get tired because i think the work gives you the energy and the strength to continue and um, when i see the community involving themselves in the work and when little children seeing the enthusiasm in the little children when they uh, come for hatchling release and when they ask questions uh, that gives me the strength to continue and carry on uh, so that's what i would like to share so my last question uh, it really sort of deals with the future and i'm going to combine it into sort of one question which is as we make this richer organization richer in humanity richer in points of view out of the explorers club what is your wish what is your hope for what this might bring for you personally to your work and to the world and i will start with generia thank you so my hope um normally people will ask me is there hope for lion conservation in northern kenya and i believe yes because lions are on my our hands now as community now we are the one like taking care of the lion and making sure we are not going to lose the lions in the new fisher the the explorer that i hope to get more ideas from many various uh, colleagues who can help me in other things that you know are similar to myself like what you said that you know a lion is like kill right in your place like how how is that how is those people you know feel because sometimes you go in the bush and you think oh you know like you are tied up like you are really frustrated and people are screaming at you and really want even to kill you because you are cow of me kill so to get more ideas and more you know help from our colleagues from the explorer that have give me a lot of hope like in some issues that i know that i i may ask that how do you deal with your sharks how do you deal with this and then i can refer to lion conservation so that because we are in a, a small world here in northern kenya that these are communities that have never seen on the internet even read that oh even lions like we are dealing with lions here in other part of the country people are dealing with elephants and in other part of the country people are dealing with something different so that just in the little world thinking of their own little cow so that will give me a message also to say this is what is happening there as well because mm -hmm. i really have a very strong hope and work with colleagues and so happy to be part of this amazing uh, you know group of explorer and hoping to really get more ideas on my work and helping my community and my work yeah kasarina great and thank you again for for having me today uh so i like to think about the values that we want to inspire through our work um and i like to think about the um the four c is um curiosity compassion creativity and courage um and i think these all fit together in conservation work um first of all curiosity um we want people to ask lots and lots of questions and question the world around them and question how we're doing things and how we're living and um and then think about compassion um how can you care for the natural environment around you how can you care for people who are in your own community and people who are in different communities um there's a new kind of um uh, exploration and there's a new kind of connections around the world um but that kind of compassion for others um and compassion for the next generations i mean how are we really planning for what's what's coming who are coming after us and i think creativity is huge um and joe you've certainly been a master in this but how can we put our collective creativity to coming up with really new and sustainable ways of living on our planet just because we've done something in the past doesn't mean that's the way we need to do it going forward let's think outside the box let's be creative here 
and, and courage. Um, fighting for environmental protection and for the communities that depend on a healthy environment really takes courage. Um, this past year has been challenging for, for me personally, um, standing up against um, you know, big, big battles that we've been fighting. And I think this is something that we want to inspire in the next generation and we want to inspire around the world. Um, so those, those four C's are something that I think um, we can build off each other's energy, we can build off each other's work, and, and um, I'm really excited about the future. Great. Uh, Kali. Yeah, this is a, this is a tough question. Um, so I think that there are three main things that I, I am kind of hoping to come from this experience with the Explorers Club. Um, so the first thing is collaboration on solving biodiversity loss. Uh, conservation and you know, this, this issue is not something we're going to be able to solve alone, working in our independent channels. Uh, it requires working together. It requires collaboration, both uh, geographically, you know, across geographic boundaries and across industries. So I'm, I'm hoping that some collaboration will be possible through connections or, um, or just through ideas. Uh, and then I'm hoping that I can add something to the conversation because that's, I'm sure we've all experienced imposter syndrome to some extent, but coming into this club, like the club and seeing the accomplishments of so many other people, the, my immediate question was, you know, what am I doing here? Like, what can I add to this? And so I hope that I can bring something, um, whether it's uh, showing showing people how cool it is to work with young people, which obviously people in this group already know, but uh, there are many others who who ha maybe haven't been working with youth and uh, could benefit from it because they bring so much in, in the way of creativity and uh, cool ideas that may be risky but are worth trying. Uh, so I hope I can bring something in those lines. Um, but if I'm honest, I think what I'm expecting to take away and most excited to take away is that working in this sphere of conservation and being a human who cares about the planet um, as all of us do it takes a toll and sometimes you know when you wake up and you see a dozen notifications about the desk up the desk group to review or the you know um, the report the IPCC report it uh those are things that drain you of your energy to keep working. And it's groups like this that supplant that energy. And um, so seeing each of you doing such incredible work is the fuel that, you know, keeps the fire burning. So I'm, I'm really excited to be part of a network that can help, you know, keep us all going. Great. Onkuri? Yeah, so when I think of um, what I would like is not just Explorers Club, but in general amongst all people is, you know, for this change in attitude towards wildlife, nature in general, because right now the whole attitude is, oh, we're humans, we're separate from nature and wild animals particularly must sort of pay, as it were, for their right to exist, you know, either by being hunted for sport or being collected for entertainment or, you know, even in terms of how much tourism revenue can we generate. Now, mm -hmm. sure, it's a good thing to generate revenue from tourism, from saving wildlife rather than destroying it. But that's still thinking in terms of nature has to earn its right to exist by being useful to humans in some way. And I think as long as we think that way, there will always be people who will find loopholes that you can earn more money by um, hunting these animals than by bringing tourists in. So I would like to see a complete sea change in that attitude that no one should be arguing that nature has to, or wild animals have to earn their, their right to exist by being useful to humans. They should just have a right to exist anyways. That's the big change I want to see in my lifetime. Right. And Supraja. Um, 
I believe that attitudinal change is very, very important. So uh, we do extensive outreach and awareness programs. Uh, the message is the same, but it's tailored for different age groups and different uh, sections of community. Uh, I believe that when people uh, see and they get to care, uh, they will surely protect, um, as I was inspired by Dr. Jane Goodall. So, and we also believe that each and every individual can make a difference. So when a person sees an ex uh, experiences something in nature, like when they come for a hatchling release or come and watch a turtle nesting, it's a life-changing experience. So uh, they will change and small, small, uh, simple lifestyle changes can help protect um, you know, future generations of all life forms. And uh, I believe that uh, when the community is involved in the conservation program and the children are in the community also get to see uh, all the wonders of the ocean and what is happening, they learn more about the ocean by involving themselves in the conservation program. They will be, be the future stewards of the conservation program. And being, uh, being selected uh, the EC50 has really been such a wonderful experience for me because like how Kajarina told me, last year was a very, very challenging and difficult year for me uh, in our, for our conservation and for Tree Foundation. But uh, when uh, having been selected for this was such a wonderful experience and knowing that so many amazing and uh, uh, people who, you know, you never know that these kind of uh, work people do such kind of work. So when I went through some of the profiles, I was really amazed. And uh, in, in my country or in where, or at least let me say the Bay of Bengal region where we are working, so little is known about the oceans. And so I'm hoping that uh, being, uh, uh, being here and getting, I will hope to get to meet or get to know some of the ocean uh, explorers. So we could bring some uh, science and some uh, scientists with wonderful, some of the wonderful um, gadgets and the equipments to come and do some studies in our offshore region so that we will be able to show what is there um, in our ocean. Because only when you know what is there, you will want to protect it. Like in the when you go to the forest, you can see the trees, you can see the animals just standing in one place. But when you people come to the beach, they can only see the water lapping on their feet. And in our country, it's not easy for everyone to go snorkeling or scuba diving. So they don't know the wonders of the ocean. So I'm hoping that uh, being here um, could help me connect with uh, some uh, oceanographers or some explorers who would want to come and do some uh, um, explorative work or studies in the ocean of our Bay of Bengal region and share the science and the wonders of the ocean to the children and the people in our country so that thereby I'm hoping that we will be able to protect what is still remaining. That's my hope and I'm sure that uh, it will be possible um, uh, being a member in this uh, Explorers Club. That's my hope and my wish. Thank well, you so I wanna, much. Yeah, I want to thank all of you. I really do truly believe that by bringing such people into the club, we create a kind of new alchemy new diagrams, new connections, new formulas of conversation between people that changes the club. And the benefit of that is to make something that is so familiar into a new territory that we can then explore ourselves, to literally explore what it means to have people like yourself brought within this circle, to hear those voices and to have those voices affect change within as well as out in the world. So I, I want to thank you all for the work that you do and for the value that you bring to the Explorers Club itself. Uh, and then uh, we can um, hope for the future that as we go forward, we really can support you. I have found, I, I'm an artist and a designer uh, and was surprised myself to be invited uh, to be a member of the Explorers Club. And I have found it from the very first to be remarkably welcoming and supportive. So I, my hope is that all of you will find the same thing. How terrific was that? Unfortunately, every great story and expedition has to come to an end, but it doesn't have to come to an end for you 
because we have a next installment of the Explorers Club 50 Speaker Series. I'll see you then.